When you think of a typical haunted house, you'll usually think of a huge great big mansion with gothic architecture and towering walls that dominate the local landscape. It's probably abandoned and left to ruin, with nature taking back what was once hers, just to add to the atmosphere of the place. And that's exactly the story of the supposedly haunted Guy's Cliff House, with phantom women doomed to play out their final moments through to restless poltergeists that react with violence towards disrespectful visitors. This shell of the formerly stately home still appears to harbour residents with with unfinished business. The ruins of Guy's Cliff House sit along the banks of the River Avon near Warwick. But the history goes back way further than the remains of the former building that's there today. Because this spot with the running river and the caves in the cliff face would have all been super significant to the ancient Celtic population. Like these features in nature, they would have been seen as gifts from the gods. It is a gorgeous spot and people have flocked here for centuries. And that's exactly what St. Dubricius thought when he built an oratory dedicated to St. Mary Magdalene on top of the cliff in 450 AD. And he would have chosen this very exact spot, which just so happened to be perfect for a chapel, because it's the perfect spot to hitch up a little bit of Christianity. There's no better way to convert pagans into good old church going Christians than by turning their sacred spaces into Christian places of worship. And we see this quite a lot in our history. It happened all over the country. Christians would come in and try to convert the local pagan population by building churches all over their pagan temples and places of significance. So from the the looks of it, there aren't any records or anything from its time before Christ. We've only got the evidence of when this first oratory was built. And if you don't know, an oratory is basically a small chapel, and in Saxon times they would have been built on top of a cliff overlooking a river. So another reason that this would have been like a perfect spot. And so yeah, so while we don't have too much information from those very early days, we do have a story from, I'd say one of the most famous residents of the area, a man called Guy of Warwick. According to the legend, he fell in love with a woman called Felice, who was the daughter of the Earl Rowand of Warwick, the king's governor. So pretty high up. But Rowand didn't think that Guy was good enough for his daughter. So Guy went away and he put in the work. He went and worked on himself. Cue this 80s montage of Guy like going off on heroic quests, which basically culminated in him being knighted Sir Guy of Warwick. At that point, the Earl of Warwick was like, all right then, you seem like a pretty stand up guy now. And so gave the couple his blessing to get married, which they did. But I mean, let's face it, I'm talking about it. So it probably isn't gonna end in a happily ever after, is it? Apparently they had a son called Rainbrow, but he was, quote unquote taken when young and it could have been because of this losing his young son or maybe some of these heroic quests were less about slaying monsters and saving villages and more like murder and war crimes you know so he took a pilgrimage to Jerusalem left his wife at home doesn't tell her what's going on Felice is just like okay then she stayed at home being a good wife to her absent husband like she helped the poor and things like that when he came back from Jerusalem he chose to live as a hermit in a cave along the river Avon and obviously Felice was heartbroken about this the man that she'd fallen in love with, who she had patiently waited for to come home, has just basically decided that this life isn't for him and wouldn't even tell her what's going on, just had no contact. But eventually, years passed, Guy was on his deathbed while still living in these caves as a hermit, and he gave a local herdsman his ring to give to Felice. First of all, fair play to the herdsman for actually taking the ring to the wife and not like pocketing it, but she obviously recognised it immediately and went straight to the cave. But the story goes that Guy was already dead by the time that she arrived. And I mean, that was it. Like, her husband had been living not that far away for all of these years. Like, she was completely broken. And 14 days after Guy died, she threw herself from the cliff. This is just one version of the story. Obviously, it's such an old story that there are so many different alternatives. Some say that Felice actually killed herself while Guy was away on his pilgrimage, and that was the reason he became a hermit when he returned. Another potential explanation that some historians have come up with is that Guy actually contracted leprosy while he was off in Jerusalem, and maybe that's the reason why he basically hid away. Whatever version of the story that you believe in though, there is a legend of a suicide that took place on the grounds of Guy's Cliff House. But Guy was only one of what looked like quite a few different hermits that took up residence in the caves in the area. And so I was getting a bit confused while I was researching this one because I haven't really looked into hermits in any depth before and was a bit like, 
why are all these people becoming hermits? And so to me, a hermit is kind of just like a recluse from society. I understand living as a hermit because I have a Wi-Fi connection and I can get Tesco deliveries to my house. So in a very mild sense, I'm probably a hermit. But like to be a hermit back in those days, like you don't have Wi-Fi and Tesco deliveries. Like it's gonna be a very hard existence, even more difficult than it would have been anyway. But the reason is being a hermit, especially back then, it obviously had a bigger meaning that was tied to religion in most cases. It was a way of basically rejecting society and its sinful ways. And it was a way for some people who thought that becoming a nun or a monk and then going and living in an abbey or a monastery wasn't godly enough. Being a hermit for those people would get them even closer to God in their own solitude. And so we've got records of in 1327, Thomas de Lewis, he was a hermit at Guy's Cliff and he possessed king's letters offering him protections. So he could basically be left in peace as a hermit. And then in 1409, a guy called John Burry, he's recorded as being a hermit in Guy's Cliff. Like it's still retaining this religious significance. People can sort of like become a hermit in this area and become closer to God, have that stronger connection with God. Over the years, a proper chapel was built and priests would live here. And in the 1400s, a guy called Richard Neville actually sculpted the eight foot tall statue of Guy in the south wall of the chapel as like a nod to the legend which is still in the chapel to this day. In 1547, the estate became an actual private residence for the first time. Like the chapel had survived Henry VIII and his disillusion of the monasteries, like where he basically just took all of their wealth and forced a load of them to close down. But the land around the chapel was given away to a Sir Andrew Flummock. And so the first actual house at Guy's Cliff was a Tudor timber construction house for Andrew, his wife, and two sons to live in. And it passed through family members and changed hands over the next couple of hundred years until 1751 when Samuel Greatheed bought the estate. And so obviously like the building is very old at this point. It was in a little bit of a sorry state and didn't really reflect the fashions of the time for a wealthy landowning family. Samuel Greatheed, he spent about 6,000 pounds, which is about 1.1 million pounds in today's money. So like a lot of money to do up the entire house and grounds over the next five years. And it became a glorious mansion. Now it was fit for an aristocratic 1700s family. And I'm gonna mention it because it is important. Yes, Great Heed was a barrister and a member of parliament, so he was a very important man, but he had also inherited a Caribbean plantation from his dad in St. Kitts, which is where a lot of the wealth came from off the backs of 240 slaves. The house continued passing down the generations until Bertie Greatheed became the owner. And he was described as a child of the romantic era. All of that gorgeous Gothic architecture, we have him to thank. He carried out major restoration work on the building between 1819 and 1824. And then in 1915, it became an auxiliary hospital for the Red Cross, caring for sick and injured soldiers of World War I. During the three years that it was a hospital, it housed 663 patients. So it wouldn't be beyond the realms of imagination to go out on a limb and say that some of these patients most likely died within the walls of Guy's Cliff House. And then in World War II, it became St. Michael's Boys Home for wartime refugees with 39 boys living there. At the end of the war though, in 1945, the house was put up for sale. And there was talk of a group of businessmen who wanted to buy the house and turn it into like this 30 room luxury hotel. But that seems to have just like fallen through. Nothing really ever came of it. In 1951, the Ministry of Housing and Local Government had to put a preservation order on Guy's Cliff House because it looked like it was heading towards a total demolition to build houses on it. But that didn't last long as then a year later in 1952, that preservation order ended and basically permission for partial demolition was granted by the local council. And by this point, it had been completely stripped of anything remotely valuable and was in a complete state. In 1955 though, a guy called Mr. Aldwin F. Porter bought the house, which first of all, cool name, if you know, you know. But I think his plan was that he wanted to kind of restore the house to live in it. But I think it was just way too far gone by this point. So he built a house on the grounds instead. In 1974, he leased out the chapel and a few of the outbuildings to the consortium of local Masonic lodges. So now the Freemasons, which is like a not so secret, but still secret society, they hold their meetings there. They had to put in the work to restore the bits that they needed to use so that they could use it as a Masonic lodge though. In 1980, they actually purchased the property and are still the owners today. And the voluntary organization, Friends of Guy's Cliff, that was set up the year after to help with like the upkeep and maintenance where they could. 
Like they'll host like garden parties and open days and things like that to raise money for the estate. In May of 1992, an opportunity came up for the house to earn a little bit of extra income as the location for an episode of The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The episode was called The Last Vampire and it was gonna basically culminate in this vampire character burning inside of his mansion. The crew would place jets around the set to like simulate the fire, but just at the last moment, the wind direction changed and sparks from the jets set fire to the rotting beams and woodwork inside the building. To make it all worse, where the fire was, firefighters couldn't get to it. So the house was on fire for 10 hours before they could put out the flames. And so if it wasn't a complete ruin before that, it more than was afterwards. And then over the next five years, they had to basically do what they could to stabilize the rest of the house. But essentially what you see there today is pretty much the aftermath of the fire and obviously decades of ruin. The only bit that really resembles any sort of habitable building is the chapel that's still used as the Masonic Lodge. And then the undercroft, basically what was called the mansion under the chapel. Originally, these would have been the rooms where the priests would have used, and then just became a part of the house, like as storerooms and things like that. And so if you go and visit the house nowadays, you'll see all of this architecture, the ruins of the house, but you may also see something else. A guy called Adrian King, he's like a custodian of the house, and the reason he even became interested in the house is because of a ghost story. It was an encounter that his dad had with the place. So while his dad was standing on a bridge further down the river at the Saxon Mill, which also sits on the estate, he noticed a woman standing on one of the high balconies at the house. And he said that she seemed to have like this green aura about her. But before he could do anything, the figure threw herself off the balcony down onto the ground. And this seems to be reported a lot at Guy's Cliff House. A lot of people speculate that it's Felice, Guy of Warwick's wife, which would make sense considering the legend. It's just interesting that she's seen throwing herself off balconies that were part of the house. Obviously during her time, there wasn't even a private residence on the land at all, so mm, it's just interesting. And there is a part of the cliff face which is now being called Felice's Leap, which overlooks like the courtyard and the house. And there was one occasion where a group were up there and they reported that they could see like wisps of white, like sparking off in different areas of the grounds, which is a very weird thing to report. And it doesn't really sound like reflections or bugs catching in lights or anything, but there have also been multiple reports of this woman in white seen walking around the grounds. She may have even been seen as far out as the house that Alduin Porter built in the 50s, as there have now been reports of a woman in white or grey seen walking up the house's driveway. So Adrian has also had multiple encounters during his time with the house, and this may have started the first time he went to go and start documenting the house. He decided that he wanted to start a website about Guy's Cliff and kind of preserve the history and the house in its current state and all of that. So he'd seen a sign for a garden party going on, obviously one of those organized by the friends of Guy's Cliff, and he thought it was a decent opportunity for him to go take some photos ready for this new website. As he was walking up the drive, he noticed a man that was standing at the side of the drive, staring at him. He had a dog sat next to him. As soon as Adrian caught this man's eyes, he just got the feeling that something wasn't right. Like hair standing up on the back of your neck kind of thing. Being that kind of polite British where you just carry on and just shuffle past someone without saying anything, he did just that. Just carried on walking and just thought like, you know, that was very weird. I'm just gonna give it like a quick glance back. And like, as he'd been walking up to this guy, he'd been standing directly face on towards Adrian. And obviously now he'd walked past this strange guy, he should have had his back to it, but he didn't. This guy had almost done a complete 180 and was standing again, staring face on at Adrian. Again, Adrian got that, this ain't quite right, hair standing up kind of vibe. And the whole thing was just very strange. Was it just an eccentric neighbor? Or was it one of the remaining residents of this abandoned ruin checking Adrian out, making sure he had good intentions for the house? On another occasion, Adrian was leading a paranormal investigation with a friend and they'd split up into two groups and Adrian had taken his group into the undercroft bit and the friend had taken their group up into the chapel itself. Adrian had started this vigil and was trying to do the whole like knock once for yes, twice for no kind of thing. And they were getting loud knocks back. Like it had to be something in the room with them. It was so loud, but they weren't lining up with the questions that Adrian's group was asking. Adrian and his mate had walkie talkies and at this point the friend was like, I think you need to come up to the chapel, things are kicking off. So Adrian and his group went up and by the time they got there, the chapel group were all outside looking pretty disturbed. 
Turns out that it wasn't Adrian's group getting the knocking responses, it was the friends group. The knocking was in response to their questions, but the knocking was so loud that it was shaking the floor and the walls, explaining why Adrian's group was also hearing the knocking being fairly loud. And this is a big solid stone building, there's 10 foot of rock separating the two groups. But the chapel group felt like if they'd carried on, the building was gonna fall down around them. And the chapel itself, it has a lot of activity. One night, Adrian and two other people were just sat in the chapel, possibly on like a paranormal investigation, and they saw a lightning bolt kind of shoot across the floor. And I know exactly what they mean by that, because I experienced something incredibly similar while I was at the National Justice Museum in Nottingham. And so I'll say again what I said there, Maybe it's your brain doing funny tricks, like seeing weird things in the dark. But that seems to apply less here, as all three people saw this bolt of lightning. And it is just a bolt, like one second it's there, burning your eyes with how bright it is, and then it's gone, and that's it. There was also a time when two electricians came into the chapel to work on the fire alarm. They both said like, oh, who else is in this building? There's like a party kicking off upstairs. We can hear loads of footsteps and people moving about on a wooden floor upstairs. There was, of course, no one upstairs. But what also makes this interesting is that the room upstairs is carpeted, which sounds very different to a wooden floor if someone really was walking up there. Most of the time, people will report like the sounds of people moving furniture up there too, but there's never anyone there. And the rooms underneath the chapel too though, like they seem to be just as active. There is another story from Adrian, he was saying that there was a woman on this paranormal investigation once, and they went down into these rooms. As they were walking in, the woman kind of just said like, oh, this place would make a great casino, as you do. Which I don't think whatever was there was very happy about. Considering that for a lot of its life, it was a very religious place. They started doing a table tipping experiment and the response was pretty much immediate and violent. This table was tipping up with so much force, like Adrian was on the one side trying to force it down to stop it from pinning the woman that had commented about the casinos which is just crazy to think about, like that's a lot of force. The old coach house is another spot worth a mention as apparently there's been a few entities that have been reported here. The first is of a stable boy called Jacob and he's no older than like 14, 15. And then there's also apparently reports of a man fearing for his life and then a woman that was suspected of being a witch and was killed by being crushed under a board. You know where they place that board on you and then they'll like put the weights on? There have also been claims of poltergeist activity down here with throwing stones, pushing chairs and loud bangs coming from the old coach house to try and get people to leave. And Guy's cave, so the cave where Guy of Warwick is said to have lived as a hermit is also supposed to be haunted with disembodied voices heard echoing in the chamber. There's also another little cave called Cloister's Cave which is also apparently active. And I don't think they actually know what this was used for. Like it could have potentially been a Roman temple maybe. Like historians have said it kind of looks similar to what a temple for worshipping the Roman god Mithras would have looked like, but they're not entirely sure. But people will report the feeling of just being touched by unseen hands or as if someone invisible has just like brushed past you kind of thing. And also some people will just be overcome with this like overwhelming sense of sadness and just have to leave. There was also a well on the grounds and apparently in this area there is a vortex of energy. So could this be responsible for all the activity that's reported? Like these entities don't appear to just haunt the house and obviously the chapel because there have been potentially paranormal reports from locations that used to be part of the estate, like the Saxon Mill. And the mill sits just down from the house, originally belonging to the Abbey of St. Mary's in Kenilworth, until Henry VIII came along and did his thing, the dissolution of the monasteries. After that, the mill became part of the Guy's Cliff estate until the Second World War, and it's now a pub. And so this story is coming from quite recent times, as it was reported by a chef who was working there when the pub was part of the harvester chain. And so the chef was in the kitchen and had just opened up the side door that leads out onto the balcony to let a bit of air in. Just out of the corner of his eye, he noticed through the window that there was a white figure walking by the balcony. And he just assumed like someone must have come up the outside steps to get in the kitchen and was about to walk through the side door that he'd just opened. Like there was no other reason for anyone else to be up there, but no one did. He thought it was a bit strange and he looked out into the window and there was no one there. Then he noticed the white figure walking by outside on the balcony again and again, there's no one there. He hadn't long started this job, so he mentioned it to some of the other staff members and they were like, oh yeah, that's Monty, our resident ghost. He likes to knock things over and slam doors, but he doesn't seem to be particularly negative. 
I think they commented that it's actually quite entertaining, like, oh, wonder what Monty will get up to next kind of thing. But with the entities attached to Guy's Cliff House itself, and all of the bad luck that seems to have happened to the once great mansion, it's no surprise that the paranormal reports are slightly more, not necessarily all out negative, but just seem sadder, almost melancholic. Maybe it's previous owners or tenants that are upset about the state of the house currently, and maybe even grieving for what the building could have been. But do let me know what you think, because even as a ruin, I think this house is absolutely beautiful. Like, it is a shame that it probably more than likely will never be restored to its former glory. I think there was like a reconstruction model done on what it would have looked like. There are some photos of what it looked like in the past with the gardens and all that, obviously. And even I'm a bit like, oh, you know, like it's a shame. And I've only known about the place for a week while I was researching. It's a shame what happened to the house. Like so many people came in and loved it over the centuries, like poured their hearts and souls and bank accounts into restoring it. And so I can only imagine that if they could see it now, like they would kind of have those sentiments that I have, but times like a million. And that might be a big emotion, like a big energy that might draw these entities back here. And over the years, you've got it as this sacred space to ancient pagans, and that usually comes with a lot of spiritual energy. You've got the hospital in World War One, where people were probably going through a lot of trauma and most likely died here. It's not unreasonable to assume that over the centuries, people will have also have drowned in the river. And so you've got that speculation of a lot of potential death around the place. And so I think that, yeah, like there's more than enough potential for the place to be haunted. Like obviously some of those things are speculative, but you know what I mean? Could some of the stories have been influenced by the legend though? Like at least in Guy's cave and the reports of the woman throwing herself from pretty much any high place she could find, maybe. And then maybe people's imaginations running away with them when they look at the ruin itself. I mean, like, come on, it's as atmospheric as atmospheric gets. So that could potentially come into play. But if I had to pick a side, I would say yes. It's probably more than likely that this place is haunted. But please do let me know your thoughts. Haunted? Just a bit creepy looking? Tell me below. Considering I don't live a million miles away from this place, I was horrified that I hadn't heard of it before. And it's got such an interesting past, like so many people who called this place home over the centuries. And shout out to Terry Roberts, who has written a few books of the place. I was able to get my hands on further recollections of a country mansion. You can't buy it though. I had to drive like a two hour round trip to the closest library that had it on the shelf because I think you can only get it in Warwickshire libraries because obviously the house is in Warwickshire. But either way, it was great to get those extra bits of information and context that potentially aren't out there on the internet. And just to try and like hopefully do this house's history justice. But anyway, that is enough from me today. I cannot wait to chat with you more about the morbid, mysterious and macabre. So until next time, sleep safe. When he came back from Jerusalem, he chose to live as a hermit in a cage along- in a cage? <laughs> cave.